we have been talking about uh, the concept of drying and how important it is. Um, the most important picture in the drying process is this one. So, in the x axis you have a moisture content and in the y axis you have the rate of drying. So, initially you have a plenty of uh, water present on the surface of uh, the solid. So, drying takes place as the uh, liquid starts evaporating or the solvent starts evaporating. So, the drying is constant that is why this is called a constant rate drying. So, here the uh, only um, factor that is limiting is how much heat you are able to supply, so that the material gets uh, um, dried that means or the liquid gets vaporized. So, the rate of evaporation is matching with the heat of uh, vaporization um, which is also equal to the, the driving force which is the vapor pressure um, of water to the uh, partial pressure of water at the temperature condition. Now, once uh, uh, the water starts drying from the surface, um, the surface has only less amount of water, more water is present in the interstices or in the pores. So, there has to be some water um, which needs to diffuse out of these pores, come to the surface and then gets evaporated. So, what happens in that time the rate of drying starts falling down and that is what is called falling rate period. So, as time progresses the water which are uh, found inside has to diffuse out and then get uh, evaporated. So, it becomes slower and slower and slower, slower, slower and that is what is called the falling rate period here. So, initially you have a constant rate period and then the rate of uh, drying falls down um, as a function of time. Finally, the amount of moisture present in the solid reaches an equilibrium value, value with the surrounding air. So, the surrounding air contains certain relative humidity. So, this particular moisture content is called the equilibrium moisture content. So, this equilibrium moisture content is the uh, concentration of water um, in that material present which is in equilibrium with the amount of water present in the air at that particular temperature. Okay. You cannot dry the material below this water concentration unless you change the relative humidity of the water. Now, the constant rate period and the falling rate period are separated by something called the critical moisture content that is the moisture content until which the rate of drying is constant and below which the rate of drying keeps falling down with the time. So, that is called the falling rate period. So, you have a constant rate period, you have the falling rate period and in between you have the critical moisture content and finally, you have the equilibrium moisture content. Now, the time overall time required for drying a material starting from some initial moisture content to some final moisture content um, equation will look like that. There are two terms in this equation one is related to constant rate period other is related to the falling rate period. So, this corresponds to the rate of drying where the driving force is difference between the initial and the critical moisture content whereas, this one relates to the falling rate period. Okay. So, this is how the time um, required to dry a material can be calculated using this particular equation. It is a very useful equation um, if we want to design dryers and if you want to find out what will be the batch time for drying a material starting from some concentration to some other concentration. So, you can see that if I increase the area here the drying time goes down. If the mass m s is increased drying time goes up. Uh, and so on actually. Okay. So, drying is a very important uh, unit operation which is practiced in chemical industry, pharmaceutical industry, biochemical industry and so on. This is generally the last step in the downstream process. So, one important point which we need to keep in mind is um, the temperature sensitivity of the material and um, if the material is very temperature sensitive we cannot afford to increase the temperature. Um, so, we apply vacuum. Uh, so, that the temperature does not go up too much. Now, um, analogous to drying using temperature, we can also uh, remove water or moisture from a solid using something called uh, uh, freeze drying or lyophilization. Okay. This is practiced quite a lot in the area of uh, biological systems 
because they are highly temperature sensitive. So, that is called the lyophilization. So, let us look at uh, lyophilization uh, in detail and we will look at also what are the parameters uh, that contribute uh, in this particular process. Okay. So, what is lyophilization? It is also called freeze drying that means we are removing water from the frozen material. So, if you freeze a material with the water present, so what happens? The water becomes ice, the material also gets frozen and then when you change the temperature or when you change the pressure, the ice directly goes into the vapor. So, it does not go into the liquid at all. So, you select so that okay, you select a, a operating condition so that the ice directly goes into vapor and it does not go through the liquid phase that is what is called freeze drying. So, what do you do in a freeze drying? You cool it uh, sufficiently so that everything gets frozen including the water and then you change the pressure or reduce the pressure or increase the temperature so that ice directly goes into vapor it does not become the liquid. So, it is a very good method for preserving microbes, heat sensitive materials such as proteins, plasma for example, blood plasma um, nothing like uh, doing a freeze drying. Okay. So, in a freeze drying we control both temperature and pressure. So, um, for example, if I have some pharmaceutical product in vials, I can use uh, the freeze drying technique uh, to remove the uh, water or moisture present at the same time keep the vials in a um, sterile condition. So, that is the advantage of using a freeze drying in pharmaceutical setup. Now, this is called a phase diagram for water. So, in a phase diagram we can um, see where uh, solid ice is present, where liquid water is present and uh, um, vapor is there, okay, water vapor is present. So, you have all three of them together. Okay. So, like you have the solid, you have the liquid and we have the vapor. Uh, so, as the pressure is increased you have the solid region and as the temperature is increased you have the uh, vapor region and then in between you have the liquid region. Now, if you look at this there is something called a triple point okay, where the solid liquid and the vapor meet okay, this is called the triple point. This is at 0 0.01 degree centigrade and 4.6 mm mercury. Okay. So, if we are operating here we have to if you want to move from solid to liquid to vapor like this. Whereas, if you are operating here you can see that I can directly move from vapor to solid or from solid to vapor. I do not have to go through the liquid at all. Okay. So, if you are here somewhere and you want to go to solid you have to go through liquid or if you are here from solid you have to go through liquid to vapor. Whereas, if you are operating here you can directly go from vapor to solid or solid to vapor. Okay. Now, there is another point that is called the critical point where the liquid and the vapor meet okay. and this region is called the supercritical fluid. You must have all heard about supercritical fluid, supercritical CO2, supercritical water and so on actually you know where the fluid behaves like a liquid or a gas. So, it has got both the useful properties of the liquid as well as the gas. So, supercritical carbon dioxide has become very very important and uh, we also talked about it long time back in the extraction process where a supercritical carbon dioxide can be used very effectively for extracting natural product uh, metabolites or uh, um, useful chemicals from phytochemicals um, where you do not need to use high temperature which may uh, denature or deactivate such sensitive material. So, supercritical uh, fluid region is this where you are operating above the critical point where the liquid and the vapor behaves like a supercritical fluid. Okay. So, that is supercritical fluid whereas, at the triple point here we can move from vapor that is water vapor directly to ice solid ice or we can move from solid ice to vapor. So, if you are operating in this region if you are doing a lyophilization. So, all you need to do is you reduce the temperature so that the ice is formed and then uh, you play around with temperature and pressure so that 
the ice directly goes into vapor. So, by doing this uh, alternatively, we can slowly remove whatever um, water is present to a vapor form. So, in this process you are not uh, increasing the temperature unlike drying. So, the uh, material which needs to be dried is completely being operated at low temperature. So, it does not get denatured. It is a very useful technique especially for uh, um, proteins, especially for uh, plasma and so on actually. Okay. So, what are the various steps in uh, freeze drying? So, what you do is you first cool the product to a sufficiently low temperature. So, by doing that you are completely solidifying uh, or converting the material into a solid form. Then what you do is reduce the pressure in the chamber to below the vapor pressure at the triple point of water. So, that there is sublimation. What is sublimation? You are converting solid into vapor that is what is called sublimation right. So, um, you are converting the solid water um, into vapor water. So, you what you do you reduce the pressure. So, initially you are reducing the temperature and then later on you are reducing the pressure. So, that solid ice becomes vapor. Um, as I said the triple point the ice water and water vapor exists in equilibrium at 0 0.01 degree centigrade and 4.6 mm mercury. So, below this triple point water passes directly from the solid to the vapor phase that is sublimation takes place. So, no problem you do not uh, the ice does not go as water. Okay. So, by doing this we are removing all the unbound water. So, that is called the primary drying. Now, later on we need to remove the bound water. So, what do we do? We slightly raise the temperature and keep the pressure down. Okay. So, by doing this then we are removing the bound water that is called the secondary drying phase. So, initially you have the primary drying phase. Um, where by reducing the pressure you are operating below the triple point. So, the solid uh, ice goes into vapor and in the second phase we are keeping the uh, pressure down, but slightly increasing the temperature. So, that uh, the bound water gets removed. Okay. So, these are the two steps. So, we have the primary drying and we have the secondary drying okay, to remove the unbound and the bound water respectively. So, generally um, in a supercritical the time required to complete the drying cycle is about 24 hours even 48 hours in the labs. Sometimes we take uh, more than a day to completely uh, remove uh, the solid. So, uh, once you do this sort of a uh, lyophilization uh, there is no water present there is no liquid phase. So, reactions like hydrolysis cross linking reactions oxidation reactions aggregation of the solid material. Uh, disulfate rearrangement all these are prevented okay. and uh, also when you dry the product completely um, it has got much higher surface area per um, volume. So, if you want to read uh, re dissolve it into some solvent then uh, it is very rapid and complete. So, that is the advantage of uh, lyophilized product. Okay. Uh, so, the three steps in um, lyophilization we have the freezing Okay. Sample is placed in a freezing vial or flask. So, in a laboratory situation we take the material uh, in a flask. If you are working in a pharmaceutical industry you take it in a vial and um, let because it becomes easier for you to um, completely seal it once you have done the freeze drying. And then next step once you have frozen the material uh, what do you do? Um, you are sub, uh, by sublimation you are removing the solid material into vapor. So, 90 percent of the total water in the sample goes away. Okay. So, some of the free water and some of the bound water goes away. Then what do you do? Uh, we are now desorbing whatever water is present by increasing the temperature. Okay. So, finally, by doing that you will end up with about 1 to 3 percent residual water. So, this step also takes some time it almost uh, 50 percent of the time it is taken for uh, removing the uh, unbound water. So, you need some time for that. So, the final step of this lyophilization we call it desorption or we call it secondary drying or drying to remove the bound water uh, like that you know. So, you reduce the moisture content to almost 1 percent. So, there is lot of uh, water which is present on the product in the form of a shell. Okay. So, it is a surface phenomena it is not a water of hydration, 
but it is more of a uh, you should not confuse uh, the removal of a bound moisture as water of removal of water of hydration. So, it is more like water present in the form of a shell like. So, you have to go up in temperature to, to about 30 to 40 degrees centigrade and may take about 4 to 5 hours actually. And if you are a, a, if you have a wild pharmaceutical product then you may slowly form ice cake like. So, generally the cake thickness may be of the order of 1 centimeter. Okay. So, there are different types of uh, freeze drying you know one is called the manifold drying. So, we have a central manifold. So, you attach uh, many ampules or drying flasks to the central manifold and then uh, the samples are frozen okay, by the shell method. Okay. First the samples are frozen separately and then they are attached to the manifold and then you are applying the vacuum prevent melting and then you bring up the temperature. So, there is a room temperature provides the heat. Okay. So, generally this type of method is very good for small volume. So, uh, first dry I mean first uh, froze freeze all the flasks separately and then they connect it to the manifold and manifold is placed under vacuum to prevent melting and then you raise the temperature to room temperature. Uh, so, this heat is sufficient to remove the uh, moisture directly uh, the ice goes into vapor. This is very good for small volumes. Okay. Um, if you are talking about uh, bigger systems then we can use uh, uh, a tray type of uh, arrangement and then there could be heating elements in the tray to supply the heat. Okay. So, we can have similar type of containers you can um, cool them all freeze it like serum vials and then um, keep it on the tray and then you apply a heat and thereby you achieve the drying process. If you have large volumes of a single sample then what do you do? You can pour the material in special trays, uh, freeze it and then dry it in a lyophilizer. But uh, one thing is you cannot uh, um, take these samples and again uh, seal it separately uh, because if you are if you are going to do that and you are exposing it to air sometimes um, the oxidation um, may affect the product quality or product stability. So, if you are talking about not exposing the material to um, outside atmosphere the best method is a manifold drying or a vial drying. So, you take the samples in hundreds of vials uh, freeze it connect it to a manifold apply vacuum slightly heat it up. So, all the moisture is removed and then you can seal the vials or flasks. So, that is the advantage of that type of uh, setup mm, whereas in this type uh, you can handle large quantity of material, but some amount of exposure after uh, lyophilization is inevitable here. So, what are the factors that affect lyophilization? The sample size, how much material I am uh, handling, surface area of the sample, is it having a big surface area per volume or the surface area per volume is less. Thickness of the sample, because uh, as you know uh, the solid ice has to convert into vapor and if you have a thick uh, ice formed vapor acid diffuse and go, above, go out. Sample characteristics that means physical properties, physical properties, viscosity and density and so on, eutectic temperature because uh, what is eutectic temperature? We are talking about solid ice and solid uh, material. So, these two can together combine to form a third um, blend of product that is where eutectic temperature comes into picture okay. because you have ice going into solid you have a, um, the actual material protein or any other chemical that is going to be um, frozen. So, both of them may dissolve and form uh, another third uh, phase and that is where eutectic temperature comes in. Solute concentration how much of solute is present in water then the instrument factors what are the various uh, instruments which you are using. Then the condenser temperature you are uh, going to ultimately take out the vapor and condense it again. So, what is the temperature and how much vacuum you are applying all these factors affect the lyophilization process. Okay. So, larger the surface area of the frozen material faster will be the rate of lyophilization this is obvious. So, if I have large lyophilizer area 
then uh, we can do the lyophilization process very fast. Uh, thicker the frozen material, slower the rate of lyophilization, right. Again, when you have thick material, um, the vapor that is formed when you apply vacuum and heat it, um, that vapor has to uh, pass through this thick frozen material before it can be collected in the condenser. So, that process is going to be slow. So, thicker the frozen material, slower will be the rate of lyophilization. So, sample thickness affects the ability of a sample to absorb and transfer heat to the surface undergoing sublimation. So, ideally I would like to spread it out on a large pan, so that uh, when the lyophilization is fast, the thickness is also less that is the frozen thickness. Whereas, if I have a very small container, uh, the area uh, for lyophilization decreases, uh, so sublimation is slower. Um, because the vapor has to diffuse through the thick solid IC material, because the water vapor must pass through the dried material and the rate of lyophilization in thick sample is slower. Especially if the dried material collapses on the surface of the frozen material. Suppose you, the dried material forms a shell like and uh, as it gets dried, it may just collapse thereby slowing down the diffusion of this vapor out into the uh, vacuum region. Okay. So, if you have volatile chemicals present, then obviously, it is going to increase the vapor pressure at the sample surface. So, we need to have a less heat of sublimation. So, the material is going to melt, it is not going to form a frozen solid. If it forms a frozen solid, then it becomes easy for you to um, convert it into vapor by applying heat, but if it is forming an ice um, okay, then it is not good if it is forming a melted. So, we need to dilute it with water prior to freezing. So, by having water more water we can form solid ice that is much better. So, volatile chemicals always lead to problems in lyophilization. So, what are the characteristics of the finished products once I have done some lyophilization um, the amount of water residual water present may be in the order of 1 to 3 percent. So, the stability of the freeze dried products it depends on the moisture present, oxygen, temperature, but if you have if you are freeze drying vials and you have a good sealing system um, you are preventing exposure to moisture and oxygen. So, it is ideal to um, do small sample in vials. So, we can seal them under vacuum. If you are storing material in high temperature, it will reduce the shelf life. So, ideally refrigeration or freezing is always good for long term storage. So, if you want to store um, blood or plasma, best thing is to freeze it or refrigerate it for long term storage, unlike storing it at high temperature. So, if you have finished removing all the bound water, then there would not be any other water, uh, it will have just very small amount of moisture present, which we call it the equilibrium moisture content. So, we can call the freeze drying to be completed actually. So, what are the advantages of lyophilization over conventional drying? So, conventional drying I have been talking about before, like right? so you apply vacuum, you apply temperature, so the water vapor evaporates and goes whereas, in a lyophilization or a freeze drying you um, freeze it, so that uh, the water becomes ice and then uh, you keep the temperature and pressure, so that uh, it does not go through the um, water phase, but it directly goes into the vapor phase. So, you are operating below the critical point. So, advantages of lyophilization is prevention of chemical and biological potency. So, preservation of chemical and biological potency, you are maintaining it. Homogeneity of the final product, the product will be homogeneous. The advantage is ease of dispensing, uh, metering before final package. You are preventing it from chemical degradation. You can rehydrate it very, very easily. For example, if you have dry powder fields like injectable penicillin, it becomes very easy uh, rehydrate it completely without any problem. So, these are the advantages of lyophilization over that. 
So, let us look at the schematic of a freeze dryer, how it looks like. This is a freeze dryer, it is a large scale industrial scale freeze dryer. So, we have a frozen solid in a big container needs to be dried. So, we have the solid is frozen, ice is formed that is water has become ice. Okay. Then what do you do? You have a refrigeration system here, you have a vacuum pump here. Okay. So, the ice becomes vapor, comes down it condenses here, again it forms uh, ice on the wall. This is giving you the required vacuum. So, you are applying vacuum here at the same time this temperature um, is high enough for the ice to directly go into vapor which is condensed here and collected here. Here you have a refrigeration system which keeps the temperature of the surface low. This is how a, a large scale freeze drying unit works actually. Okay. So, we have seen uh, different types of drying um, the conventional high temperature drying and the uh, lyophilization freeze, uh, uh, freeze drying type of uh, system where you are drying it at lower temperature whereas, in the conventional drying uh, you are drying by applying heat. So, this is one of the very important uh, downstream process um, it comes almost at the end of your downstream where um, you are reaching the finished product stage. Okay. So, what are the disadvantages of lyophilization? It is pretty expensive, capital cost of the equipment is very high, it is three times more than traditional sterile solutions or sterile dry powder fill methods, because you need a refrigeration system, you need a vacuum pump, so many things. High energy cost, two to three times, long processing time, you need long time. If I am going for a conventional drying where I am uh, applying vacuum and heating the material, so that uh, the, the water becomes vapor, I may finish it in few hours. Whereas, if I am going for a, a lyophilization or a freeze drying, where I am uh, freezing the material and then I am increasing the temperature and changing the temperature and pressure uh, to remove the moisture and so on it may take 24 to 48 hours. So, instead of 4 to 5 hours I may go to 24 to 48 hours. Okay. So, these are the advantages of uh, disadvantages of uh, lyophilization, um, but then uh, for high value proteins, peptides, vaccines this is the only way to give stable biologically active products with long shelf life. There is no other go you have to resort to this type of method. Okay. Okay. So, so far we talked about uh, different types of drying um, and uh, what are the disadvantages and advantages of different types of drying. So, that completes uh, another uh, downstream operation. Let us look at another uh, one, one another downstream operation and that is called the distillation. Distillation is also a very important downstream uh, operation if you want to separate metabolites or solvents um, mixture. The most important point here you need to keep in mind is they are not temperature sensitive that means, they can uh, withstand higher temperature. In chemical engineering, chemical process uh, and chemical manufacturing distillation is widely used because it is very fast, quick, very efficient and uh, we can end up with high purity material. But in biochemical type of situation, because we are worried about the um, temperature sensitivity of the products, we generally do not resort to distillation. But we do distillation when we want to um, recycle or recover solvents. For example, in extraction, I am using solvents for extraction. Now, I would like to recover that solvent, so that I can reuse. I cannot throw out all the solvent, so I need to reuse. So, I need to recover the solvent. I am doing washing. So, in such case chromatography I am using lot of solvents, then I would like to recover the solvent, so that I can reuse the solvent. So, in such situations I need to resort to distillation, there is no other go and it is as I said it is the most efficient and best method where you can get very pure product. So, distillation has got many advantages especially for recovery of solvents from chromatography 
recovery of solvents from extraction um, and so on. So, it is good if you want to separate liquids having different vapor pressure. So, the principle of operation is based on vapor pressure. So, um, when I heat a mixture of liquid, the liquid with lower boiling point goes into the vapor, whereas the liquid with higher boiling point remains in the solution. By doing this, I am creating an equilibrium between the vapor and the liquid phase. I am creating an equilibrium between the vapor phase and the liquid phase. So, the vapor will predominantly contain the low boiling and the liquid will predominantly contain the high boiling. Okay. So, if I for example, I have methanol water, I heat it up, there is a vapor formed, there is a liquid. So, when I keep these two in equilibrium and if I um, analyze the vapor, it will have more of methanol. If I analyze the liquid, it will have more of water, because methanol is lower boiling than water, uh, more methanol will be there in the vapor phase and uh, more water will be in the liquid phase. So, if I condense um, the vapor, I will have more methanol in that vapor. So, I can again once again take that uh, mixture again I heat it up, condense the vapor, I will have more ethanol, ethanol and so on actually. So, that is how I can recover all the methanol. So, as I said this type of distillation is very, very useful if you are uh, working on uh, recovery of solvent from uh, extraction, recovery of solvent from chromatography, um, HPLCs and so on actually. So, this is called a vapor liquid equilibrium diagram for a binary mixture. So, suppose you have two components A and B like ethanol water, methanol water. Okay. So, this is how a vapor liquid equilibrium diagram V L E we call it vapor liquid equilibrium diagram for a binary mixture. So, the x axis you draw the mole fraction of the low boiling compound. Okay. So, x axis is 0 to 1, y axis mole fraction of the low boiling component in the vapor, in the vapor again 0 to 1. Okay. So, you will get a graph like this, a curve, curve sometimes may be like this okay, or sometimes the curve may be going concave down. So, you may have a concave or you can have a convex. Now, this is called the x equal to y line. Okay. This is called the vapor liquid equilibrium diagram. So, if you take any point in this particular graph, this tells you tells you the mole fraction of the low boiling compound in the liquid and uh, this will tell you the mole fraction of the low boiling compound in the vapor. Okay. So, obviously, because I said that you will have more uh, low boiling component in the vapor than in the liquid phase. So, if you take a point and uh, project it to the x and y axis, you will have more of the low boiling component um, in the vapor phase than in the liquid phase. Whereas, if you have a graph which is very, very close to this x equal to y line, the amount of uh, component, low boiling component in the liquid phase or in the vapor phase will be equal. That means, that is called a constant boiling mixture. Okay. So, if you have this instead of this graph which is far away from the x equal to y line, if they are very, very close then x will become equal to y. That means, the concentration of the low boiling in the liquid phase or in the vapor phase is equal. So, that is called a constant boiling mixture. So, um, ideally if I boil a binary mixture, I would like to have more of the low boiler in the vapor phase and less of the low boiler in the liquid phase. So, that I can condense the vapor which will have more of the low boiler. Whereas, if the concentration of the um, component is equal in both the phases, then I am not achieving the separation. So, that is called a constant boiling mixture and a constant boiling mixture we cannot separate using a 
simple distillation at all. So, we have two components binary and uh, this particular graphs tells you the vapor liquid equilibrium for the low boiling. So, obviously, um, because it is a binary one minus the other one gives you the concentration for the high boiling. So, generally we do not plot for high boiling we always plot uh, the VLE diagram for the low boiler. Okay. Now, there is another picture which brings in not only the mole fraction for the two components, but we also bring in the concept of temperature into this and that is called a T x y diagram that is called a T x y diagram. There we also bring in the temperature. Okay. Now, let us start from this side you know. So, we have a, a is a 0, so B is 100. So, when you go to the other end we have A equal to 100 and uh, B is equal to 0 okay. and here you have on the y axis we have the uh, temperature here. So, you will have one graph corresponding to the vapor composition another graph corresponding to the liquid composition. So, here this corresponds to the boiling point for pure B this corresponds to the boiling point for pure A because here you have 100 percent A correct here you have the 100 percent A, here you have the 100 percent B. So, this temperature corresponds to boiling point of pure B, this temperature corresponds to the boiling point of uh, pure A. Okay. So, you can have the other way also that means, in this particular picture we are showing that uh, boiling point of pure A is higher than boiling point of pure B, but you can have another situation where the boiling point of pure A could be lower, boiling point of pure B could be higher. Okay. Now, this graph corresponds to vapor, this corresponds to the liquid composition. This is called a T x y binary diagram. So, if you take one point here, okay, so this is at a temperature T 1 and then you project it down and then go again to the liquid and then project it down. So, what does this mean? At a temperature T 1, the vapor will have a 2 percent of uh, the species A and B 2 percent of species B, whereas the liquid will have A 1 percent of uh, species A and B 1 percent of species B. Okay. And here the boiling point of A is higher, so obviously it A should be more in the liquid and A should be less in the vapor. Correct? and boiling point of B is less than A. So, the vapor should have more B and the liquid should have less B okay. because B 2 will be greater than B 1 and A 1 will be greater than A 2. So, you see if we have a diagram like this the T x y diagram then at any temperature all I have to do is draw lines horizontal and I can tell what will be the composition of A and B in the liquid phase, what will be the composition of A and B in the vapor phase. So, this is also a useful diagram. Whereas, if you have a VLE diagram it does not bring in any temperature aspect into it, but it just brings in the uh, compositions. Okay. It just brings in the compositions of A and B in the vapor and liquid situation. So, as I said uh, in this particular figure uh, we are saying that the boiling point of A is higher. So, A is a heavy material and boiling point of B is lower. So, B is a light material. So, um, more B is always found in the vapor whereas, more A is always found in the liquid okay, in this particular figure. So, you can have a situation uh, like this. So, you can have uh, this up and this down. So, in that situation we can say uh, B is a higher boiler and A is a lower boiler. Okay. Now, the same figure you can have different types of combinations you know you can have the uh, vapor like this whereas, the liquid may be going like this 
you may have the liquid like this, vapor may be going up like this. Okay. So, if you look here or if you look here the concentrations in the vapor phase and in the liquid phase are the same. I sometime back mentioned something if they are same they are called constant boiling mixture or they are called azeotropes that is the name for that azeotropes. So, we have a constant boiling mixture that is an azeotrope. So, um, this is a high boiling azeotrope this is a low boiling azeotrope. If you see um, the boiling point of the mixture here is higher than the individual boiling points and uh, the concentration in the vapor phase and the liquid phase will be same. And here the boiling point of the azeotrope is lower than the individual component pure component. So, that is why it is called a low boiling azeotrope and again uh, the concentration of this uh, mixture in the vapor and in the liquid phase are the same. So, we cannot separate out this type of uh, binary system because they have a constant boiling region here. So, what do you do if you have acetropes? There are different methods. You sometimes change the, uh, the pressure condition so that acetrope may go, or you sometimes you add a third component so that it breaks the acetrope. And nowadays, we are resorting to even a membrane type of uh, situations where um, we can uh, break acetropes because membranes do not work based on vapor pressure, membrane just work based on either size or um, molecular weight. Uh, uh, solubility and so on actually. So, there are pervoperation membranes which we talked about long time back um, where we can use that type of membranes for um, breaking azeotropic situations. So, how does azeotropes look in um, VLE diagram the vapor liquid equilibrium diagram. So, the azeotropes will look like that x and y. So, you may have instead of graph going all the time above the x equal to y line or all the time below the x equal to y line it will just cut at some point. Okay. If this graph all the time goes above no problem, if it goes all the time below no problem, but if it goes like this then at this place we have the composition of uh, the low boiler in the vapor and the liquid are equal okay, because this is x equal to y line. Similarly, here it will be x equal to y. So, it is called a constant boiling azeotrope. So, if you have the VLE diagram like this or if you have the TXY diagram like this uh, for a binary system you can say they are having a uh, they, they are have azeotrope. So, they cannot be separated by normal methods at all. So, there are different types of distillation columns we can use you know and uh, they are called uh, tray columns, plate columns, packed columns. So, we can have packed material inside uh, the distillation column, we can have plate type of material or we can even have trays type. So, all these help in uh, mixing the vapor and the liquid together bringing them in close contact with each other thereby you can get a better separation. So, these are the main advantages that. So, if you have a mixture two components an ideal mixture is the one which obeys Ravold's law. Okay. So, like hexane and heptane uh, benzene and methyl benzene propane one all and propane two all. So, they are called ideal. So, they all obey the Ravold's law. So, what does this Ravold's law state? So, what it says is the partial vapor pressure of a component in a mixture is equal to vapor pressure of the pure component at that temperature into mole fraction in the mixture. Okay. Okay. So, if you have a binary system the partial pressure of A is the vapor pressure of the pure component into mole fraction of that component present in the binary mixture. Similarly, partial pressure for B will be equal to pure component vapor pressure of B multiplied by the mole fraction of B present in that. Okay. So, this is a very important uh, law because it tells you that the partial pressure exerted by a component is a function of the uh, mole fraction in that mixture binary mixture as well as its 
vapor pressure. So, if the mole fraction is high, the partial pressure is high. If the vapor pressure is high, then the partial pressure is also high. Now, at the same time, the total vapor pressure of this mixture will be equal to PA plus P, PB, because PA is the partial pressure offered by A, PB is the partial pressure offered by B. So, PA plus PB is equal to total vapor pressure. So, if you are talking about uh, operating at atmospheric pressure, so PA plus PB will be equal to atmospheric pressure. And also XA plus XB that is the mole fraction of A plus mole fraction of B is equal to 1. If it is a binary system, obviously this also should be true. Okay. So, this Ravold's law tells um, that if I know properties of 1, I can calculate what will be the partial pressure of that particular um, solute. So, this is a typical batch distillation column. So, what do you do? We charge material in a reboiler okay, and then we heat it up. So, the vapor travels up and then the lighter products keep coming up, it gets condensed, it gets removed. Sometimes there is a uh, lighter gets condensed here, they may come down as a liquid, vapor rises. So, this is a column, we call it a column. It can be a packed material inside or it can be any type of material inside, which brings in a good um, mixing between the uh, liquid that is coming down and the vapor that is rising. Continuous distillation column. So, as the name implies, continuously you are feeding some mixture and the heavy material comes down, it is heated up as a vapor, so it rises the vapors get condensed and then the light product is removed. Part of the condense is sent back that is called a reflex. Okay. So, the liquid travels down, the vapor travels up. So, by this particular operation, what do we do? We are bringing the liquid and the vapor in contact with each other. So, by bringing in this particular contact, um, we are achieving the movement of the vapor. Um, into the liquid phase that means movement of the low boiling that is present in the vapor to rise and uh, movement of the heavy material to come down the column. So, by doing this operation we will have more of the heavies here that means high boiling material and uh, we will have more of the light material here that is the low boiling material. So, um, we can play around with the reflex and uh, achieve very good separation. But then if we reflect too much of the vapor down into the column, we are slowing down our distillation, we are increasing the energy requirements and so on actually. Mm, whereas, if I reduce the reflex, then my separation efficiency goes down. So, I have to keep playing with the, both these factors, so that I achieve a good separation and at the same time my energy cost does not go up. Okay. So, that is where um, we play around with the reflex. We can have different types of packing material inside like I mentioned before, we can have tray column, we can have um, packed column, um, we can have C plates, different type of plates. So, we can bring in a good mixing between the vapor that is rising and the liquid that is falling, so that the efficiency of separation is also enhanced. So, these are different ways by which uh, we can uh, bring in uh, purification and uh, recovery of uh, solvents or uh, other liquids which we want to recycle back into the process. So, distillation is a very useful technique to practice um, especially um, as I said uh, in a chromatography for recovery of the solvent which you use in the continuous phase or in the extraction process if you are interested in. Uh, recycling the solvent which you use for extraction. So, you need to understand how the distillation system works and uh, distillation has been there in chemical engineering for almost uh, 70, 80 years. So, um, the technology is well established. So, it, it is uh, easily and quickly adapted in the um, biochemical industries as well without uh, adding any extra um, research effect into it actually. And as I said, if you are handling a thermally labile material, 
then obviously distillation cannot be resorted to because uh, um, when you are operating at higher temperature um, when the material gets uh, um, um, either deactivated or uh, becomes a tarry type of uh, product. So, having talked about uh, distillation, having talked about drying and lyophilization, we will in the next class see what are the various types of uh, um, downstream that are still pending.